It's always good to save the best wine to last in medicine. <laughs> so get rid, of, get rid of the lawyers early, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. To some extent, I'm actually directing my talks particularly at the councillors, because the minister has written to the various county councils criticising quite severely, and with a lengthy report, uh, why you shouldn't have passive house as a standard in the development plan. So I just want to go through a number of points to put this in context in terms of domestic law and European law. First point to note is that there is nothing that I can find in law, and we have the biggest planning department in the country, we are the advisor to a broad planola, to the Peets Hospital and their planning application. We can find nothing in law that says that a development, that a local authority cannot go for a higher standard than the building regulations. The Minister, of course, has the power to uh, direct you in terms of your development plan. But the Minister, uh, like any public body, in making a decision, in issuing a direction, has to himself comply with law. So he must do something that is illegal, and his decision must be based on rationality and based on evidence. So if his proposition is that uh, passive house is a higher cost, is posing a cost on uh, the construction sector, he will have to show that there's evidence that the passive house is more expensive than the, than the house built in accordance with the building regulations. Of course, cost is also a slightly fungible concept. Uh, cost is more than the mere capital cost of the house. Uh, cost can, or maybe should, it's not clear, include the maintenance cost uh, and the life cycle cost, the energy costs of the house. Uh, so there's something to this, this dilemma. Does the minister want you just to build a cheap, cheap house that will cost a lot for the person to run the house over the 30-year life cycle of that house? Uh, is that how he's viewing cost? Um, and as an aside, uh, clearly, and it's in the paper again today, and with the election possibly being rumoured uh, as happening in the next month, affordability is quite a big issue for political bodies, uh, and, and rightly so. And to some extent, even a first-year degree, a first-year uh, economist will tell you that in terms of the cost of the house, if your construction costs are variable, to some extent, also your land costs are variable. And there's a, cert there's a certain element that if you bring down your construction costs, the end price to the consumer may not change because the land price goes up to pick up what the consumer can actually afford. And of course, what the consumer can afford is really quite largely and very frequently uh, a question of what the banks are prepared to fund. Um, and so it does cross my mind that an obvious answer to some of the issues that's completely logical is the banks look at the affordability of the interest payments that you have to bear so particularly with the state owning AIB, it's self-evident that there's a, an option for the state or the banks to say, listen, I'll actually lend slightly more uh, for a house that has no energy consumption or low energy consumption afterwards uh, because that's going to be cheaper for the person to run and therefore they can afford to bear higher capital cost and pay me back, pay me back earlier. Anyway, the real thing I want to talk about actually is... Um, the, the regulations that apply to uh, the Irish building uh, regulations or the law that applies to Irish building regulations. Uh, the Irish building regulations, certainly in relation to the 2011 regulations for, uh, for uh, dwellings, was adopted pursuant to the European directive called the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. I think I'm being distracted, am I? I hope there's a okay. change. Okay. Good, good, good. <laughs> um, the Commission adopted in 2010 the Energy Performance of Building Regulations. And one of the key concepts behind this was the cost, concept of, concept of cost optimization. And it required all the countries in Europe and all the member states to adopt or adapt their building regulations to reflect this concept of cost optimization. And cost optimization is like cost benefit analysis. The Commission were requiring the member states to have their building regulations uh, drafted so that people were incentivized to possibly increase the capital cost if, on a cost benefit analysis, the extra costs there would be saved over the life cycle costs of those buildings. In other words, if the energy costs drop, it makes logical sense to put in the better insulation, to put in the uh, renewable, energy, uh, renewable energy facilities so the, energy, the cost of that uh, building over life uh, is, is reduced. The uh, Irish regulations for dwellings were adapted to try to comply with cost optimization, and that is reflected in the 2011 regulations. Uh, however, interestingly, for the non-dwellings, the Irish government haven't yet adapted the building regulations. Under the Performance of Buildings Directive, each member state was required to do an analysis of their building regulations compared to what the Commission, in their techniques, reckoned would be the cost-optimal level of renewables and energy efficiency measures. And the government report, which was produced about two years ago, makes interesting reading for the 
uh, non-dwelling sector, uh, for instance, for a retail air-conditioned building, it was estimated that a cost-optimal building regulation would result in about 239 kilowatts per meter squared per year consumption. That's what you should be aiming for if you were to be cost optimal. In fact, the current Irish building regulations would allow you build with a kilowatt per uh, meter squared per year of almost three times that level, 726 uh, kilo kilowatts per meter squared per year. I don't know what a standard passive house is. Yeah, 120 total primary energy. 120, that's... Right. This, we're not talking about dwell, this is not a dwell, this is a, this is a retail air-conditioned facility. If you look at an office natural ventilation, which in fact in an environment like Ireland, um, the, the, the state agents and the architects really haven't, I think, picked up where we live, and they often require air conditioning when you don't require it in an office in Ireland. But the air-conditioned office, uh, if you were to look at cost optimization, would consume about 52 kilowatts per year. If you build according to our current building regulations, you will be allowed to consume 247 kilowatts per year. So our current building regulations for non-dwellings are off the scale in terms of what the European community has said we should do. So for the minister to say to a local authority, hey, your regulations are outside of the legal requirements and are not compliant, is somewhat perverse because in actual fact, our regulations are out of sync with what he's required to do to meet the concept of cost optimization. In relation to the dwellings, we did improve our uh, regulations and they are in line with cost optimization. Though I should say that the cost optimization report was some years ago and the cost of things like photovoltaics has crashed considerably. They've gone down to about 10% of what they were 10 years ago. So if you were to renew that evaluation, as they'd have to do in 2017, basically a year from now, you may find that in fact the current building regulations need to move slightly further. Pause there for a second. So even the current law, unquestionably done Leary or Fingal or Dublin City Council, is completely correct to go for a higher standard because we are wrong in law to have regulations that go back to 2005 in terms of what standards of energy efficiency you put in your buildings. So pausing at that and saying the dwellings may be somewhat compliant, you then look at what the European regulation looks for us to do in the future. It requires that by 2020, for all publicly occupied buildings, uh, and sorry, 2018 for all publicly occupied buildings and 2020 for all buildings that are constructed in the member states. You must build to what's called the near zero energy concept. So you ask yourself, if you're an architect now, if you want to have a building opened up uh, in 2018, if it's public, or 2020, you need regulations drafted for you now to guide you as to what you're allowed to do. And those regulations will have to be in place well before 2020. You can't have them up in 2020 because the people designing and constructing need to see those one, two, I don't know, you know better than I do, how many years in advance. And if it's a public building, again, you'll need them in advance, uh, one or two years. So by 2016, we should really be having new regulations for both dwellings uh, and non-dwellings to allow us to have that lead in time. But even pausing there, the building performance director doesn't end there. It also requires the member states to have a plan to have an intermediate target to get to nearly zero by when? By 2015. So Dunleary and Fingal, and I directed to Dunleary because you're here. Fingal couldn't make it past uh, at Viva Stadium with all the Germans, I think. Um, but you are required as a member state to comply with the European law. You should be aiming to have an intermediate target to begin to get nearly zero housing in your sector by 2015. So where are we today? We're pretty well near the end of 2015. So from what I can see, for the minister to be saying that you, who are trying to move at least a little bit closer to nearly zero uh, in 2016-17, uh, to say that you're wrong, when in actual fact you should be ahead of where even you are going today with Passive House. I don't know if Passive House meets nearly zero target. Probably can, but again, it's not been defined yet. They're probably going to define it as a, as a percentage reduction. It hasn't been legally defined. They've put in a submission to the Commission as to what they think it'll be, but it has not been adopted in law. So, but they're talking about just a simple yes. reduction, percentage reduction uh, in your energy consumption. Um, but if Passive House meets it, well then good, we're making a step towards 2015. And the reason they want an intermediate target by 2015 is to some extent you can't have a big bang. You can't suddenly go for, from outdated regulations to every builder, every architect, every plumber, every electrician and every engineer in Ireland 
having to jump from 2005 type regulations right into nearly zero. So to begin to get intermediate targets of creating our building stock to meet the standard is logical as well as being legal. Uh, and therefore, for those local authorities that jump to something like Passive House or a standard that's close to nearly zero is doing the right thing and is helping us get ready for that deadline of 2018. I'll end with just sim one simple note as well, just to, for clarity. The uh, Part L of the building regulations which con concern, concern energy consumption um, uh, really ask you to go f as far as you can in terms of energy consumption and efficiency and in insofar as it's reasonable. The guidance documents, it is clear from the wording in the Act, are, are no more than guidance documents. So if you don't follow exactly the guidance documents, it does not mean you have not met the test in Part L of the regulations. They're there just for guidance, and there are other ways you can meet um, the uh, requirement for uh, reducing your energy and carbon footprint as far as is reasonably practical than following the technical guidance documents. I hope that's helpful, and uh, I'll leave it at that and pass you on to the, to the, the better wine. <laughs>